and welcome to the Reimagining America Project's conversation called Silencing Voices, the Racialization of Representation. I'm so pleased to be with you tonight, but before we do anything else, let us open up with a word of prayer. Holy One, we are grateful to you that you have brought us together tonight, that you've given us a mission, a charge on our hearts to work towards a fully inclusive America, where everyone has their opportunity to vote, where everyone has their vote counted, where everyone is able to register their <laughs> desire, their opinion about what we should do as we move forward as a nation. Lord, as we come together, we wanna say, protect our democracy, protect the significance of each and every soul represented in each and every vote. May we move beyond the politics of division and partisanship. May we move towards a greater reality of equality, justice, and respect for each and every human being, child of God, made in God's image. May it be so. We call on you by many names, but in all of them, we ask that you would use us for your purposes. Amen. Amen. Mayor Roberts, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Sadler, and thanks for um, grounding us in uh, that opening prayer. And I want to welcome all the folks who are watching, those who are watching live, who are watching on <laughs> Um, who might be watching this later on our recorded version, but we are really glad to have you here in this most important topic about the racialization of representation in voting rights and in democracy. Uh, how appropriate to have this conversation when we are in the middle of early voting right now for the primaries in North Carolina in our 2022 midterm elections. Uh, it's a very important topic and as you may or may not know, the Reimagining America Project looks at each issue through the lens of race and how our institutions, how our history has disadvantaged those who are not white uh, through laws, through uh, policies uh, in a conscious way and how this project seeks to bring forward voices of those who've been impacted in the hopes and um, beliefs that we will change this country so that it does have equal access uh, in all the issues that we're looking at. And again, in tonight's um, conversation, we're looking at voting rights and the history of voting rights, legislation that has impacted those rights, how that has impacted people of color and marginalized communities. And uh, especially now in the digital age, we know that we have a digital divide that also connects with racial divide. Uh, and we are so lucky tonight to have a special guest who is an expert, uh, Professor William Chafe. And uh, I am going to uh, hand it back to Rodney to introduce our special guest um, and to begin this conversation. I will be joining us, uh, joining you all again uh, after they've had a conversation because we will take questions from the audience. You can put those in the chat. Uh, there's also a Q&A feature for those of you who are on Zoom. And uh, we will try to take some of those questions after we've heard this terrific conversation with Dr. Sadler and Professor Chafe. So Rodney, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Professor Chafe, welcome. And we look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Roberts. It's uh, wonderful to hear your introductions as usual. Uh, let me start off today by saying that this is the Reimagining America Project. We at the Reimagining America Project are a group of people who said that we're tired of waiting. We're tired of waiting for someone to come and rescue us, to deliver us from the horrors of racial divisions in America. We're tired of waiting for someone to fix broken police systems, broken education systems, a broken healthcare system, broken, literally every system in our community appears to be broken causing great disparities between those in black and white skin, between those who have last names that are difficult to pronounce and those who come from different countries. We have a system of inequality 
rooted deeply in our nation premise on equality. The Reimagining America Project has been working for the last three years or so, two years or so. Uh, in the aftermath of the George Floyd uprising, we determined that we are on the brink of civil war as a nation. If we don't come together and find a way past this, if we don't as citizens ourselves find a way past the malaise around race, we're gonna find ourselves in situations that we would have thought unimaginable just 10, 15 years ago. The Reimagining America Project is a truth and reconciliation process that's beginning to try to elicit a understanding of the way that the concept of race itself undermines the potential for equality in America. We don't just wanna get rid of racism. We want to get rid of the concept of race, deconstruct that concept, and then look at the system that it has shaped and work to not only dismantle such a system, but reimagine what it would look like were it just, fair, and equitable, and then work to build that just society in America. We invite you all to participate in this great work. This is work that will not be two day, three day, two month, three month, two year, three year work. This is long-term work. This is, a, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. And we know that 403 years of racial oppression in relationship to black and brown folks can't be rid of in our society overnight. It will take each and every one of us to do this work. So I wanna invite you all to participate with us, to join us, to find a way to one of our committees, to begin to do the kinds of work that are necessary to remove not just individual instances of racism, but the specter of race that looms heavy haunting our nation. Tonight, we're pleased to have a conversation with a special gentleman. I'm so pleased to be able to introduce to you uh, Dr. William Chafe. Dr. Chafe received his a Bachelor of Arts from Harvard University, his MA and his PhD from Columbia University. He is now the professor, uh, the Alice and Mary Baldwin Professor Emeritus of History at Duke University. And he serves as the co-director for the Program on History, Public Policy, and Social Change. Much of Dr. Chase's professional scholarship reflects his long-term interest in issues of race, gender equality, and other modes of bringing human beings together. He's the former Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Duke University. He's also the past president of the Organization of American Historians. He's an award-winning author of several books that uh, I will mention in just a second that have been significant for helping people to understand history in our nation. For example, he is the uh, author of a book on the Greensboro sit-ins, civilities and civil rights uh, that won the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award in 1990, 1981. His book, Never Stop Running, uh, the, Al the Allard K. Lowenstein and the Struggle for to Save American Liberalism won the Sidney Hillman Book Award in 1993. And a book he co-authored with Robert Korstad and Raymond Gavins, Remembering Jim Crow, won the Lillian Smith Book Award in 2003. He currently serves as a member of the working group dedicated to creating truth, justice, and reconciliation commissions throughout this country. So no more fitting gentleman could we have than Dr. Chafe with us today. I don't know him in this fashion. I, of course, went to Duke and uh, spent time at Duke, but I didn't get to know him there. I got to know Dr. Chafe uh, literally one day when uh, we ventured into the General Assembly building on April 20, uh, May 6th, it was 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And he was with two other former presidents of uh, his history of the American Historical <laughs> Association. And they sang songs with us, they prayed prayers with us, and they were arrested. So we first met as we sat on benches in jail together, uh, talking a little bit about this, uh, about what we needed to do to begin to change what was going on in North Carolina. I bring up that story because I wanna say that Dr. Chafe is a man who stands by what he says and what he believes about justice and working for change in America. Let's start off with a few questions that might help us to think about 
uh, our larger concern for today, which is sort of the aftermath. What's going on with voting rights? What's going on with the way that the Supreme Court uh, has addressed voting rights? Mm -hmm. If we start off thinking about the civil rights movement, we think about two significant years, two significant dates. One was uh, 1964. In this year, we passed the, the Civil Rights Act, uh, sort of as a culminating act of the civil rights movement. Uh, and people began to think that progress was being made and that we were finally making some strides. <laughs> But that led to one of the bloodiest years in the civil rights struggle, as we saw all the things that happened, all the people that were killed uh, in the lead up to the Selma campaign. And the Selma campaign uh, that began in the early part of uh, 1965, uh, not only were people killed, not only did we see Bloody Sunday, uh, but we saw a continued effort to begin to move towards voting rights. It seemed to be that Selma campaign that actually uh, brought President Lyndon Baines Johnson to uh, the table to say that we finally have to do something about voting rights, put forward the notion of uh, a Voting Rights Act uh, that eventually was passed in 1965. Let's start today by talking a little bit about what that Voting Rights Act was in 1965 and why it was so significant for helping us as a democracy uh, begin to truly uh, move towards greater equality at the polls? Mm -hmm. Well, I think very much that the uh, 65 Voting Rights Act was even more important than the 64 Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. uh, the Civil Rights Act set the groundwork for ending segregation and for engaging the federal government in the course of uh, seeking racial justice in various states. Uh, especially in terms of economics, in terms of affirmative action and things like that. Uh, but the 65 Voting Rights Act was critically important because what it really did was to transform the nature of the electorate, particularly in the 11 Southern states, uh, where you now had a federal government which was committed to registering as many black people as wanted to register to vote, and they were millions. Um, and to have those people then become part of the body politic. Uh, the 65 uh, Voting Rights Act was probably the most important piece of single, single most important piece of legislation uh, that we had during that period. And unfortunately, unfortunately, many, many white people came to the conclusion that they'd, all, that they'd solved the problem, that in effect by passing the 64 Civil Rights Act and 65 Voting Rights Act, we had, we had essentially put racism behind us. That was simply not true, as we have found out every single year since then, uh, culminating in some ways with the George Floyd matter, murder, but in so many other ways. Uh, and one of the things that I think is most, most important, uh, and which I've just finished a book about, uh, is the way in which the Black freedom struggle began in 1865, with a combination of focusing on political rights, but also focusing on economic justice. And the Freedmen's Bureau, which was established in 1865, actually set out to expropriate planters land and divide it into 40 acre and a mule packages that would be distributed to the former slaves. Tragically, that never got off the ground and Congress and the president opposed it. Now, what that really did was to show that you cannot really have equal rights unless you have the opportunity for earning a living and competing with others for a decent standard of living. Uh, and that is what we're still fighting today. Uh, no matter how many political rights we talk about, uh, we are faced with a situation in which uh, the number of black families who own houses is one fifth of what white families who own houses, the value of their property is one-tenth of what white property is worth. Uh, and we are basically in a situation where uh, poverty remains an extraordinary presence. And unless we find a way of mobilizing the same kind of mass support that led to the civil rights movement and Montgomery bus boycott, the Greensboro sit-ins, the Freedom Summer in Mississippi, uh, and uh, the legislation that followed, unless we find a way of 
recreating that kind of movement, mm -hmm. we will still be a long, long, long way from getting rid of systemic racism. Well, I, I'm grateful for you letting that, uh, laying that context because uh, those two acts, 64, 65, uh, did not completely change the, uh, the, they did not completely solve the issues. They didn't get us to where we thought we needed to go. But were they effective? Was the Voting Rights Act in particular effective at fostering change in voting in America? It was. So that uh, in Mississippi, uh, you went from having uh, maybe 8% of the black population voting to having 65% voting. And that, that increased over, over time. Uh, and the same thing was true in most other uh, Southern states. So you have in numerical terms, a very, very significant shift. Uh, and it leads to a change in state legislatures uh, with more black representatives in state legislatures, but it also leads to a change in, in Congress where you now have a number of uh, black Congress people and, 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 and even senators. Uh, but we are nowhere near where we have to be. Uh, and part of that is what we're going to start talking about in the second, the Shelby decision, mm -hmm. um, in which we simply no longer are focusing on the need to remedy political inequality in terms of Black voters. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for giving us a preview of, yeah, my next question, which really does have to do with that Shelby decision. Uh, so 2013, mm -hmm. uh, we had seen what had seemed like established law, uh, settled law, uh, as it were. We've seen settled law being troubled in these days as well. Uh, but what seemed to be settled law, i.e. the Voting Rights Act, uh, uprooted almost overnight by the nullification of one of the sections of this, uh, this, this, uh, this act. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, it seemed as though immediately there was a reaction. What was it about the Shelby versus Holder decision in 2013 that enabled such a sea change so quickly? Yeah. I remember in the state of North Carolina, I think it was the next day uh, that the quote unquote monster dis voter disenfranchisement uh, law was passed in our General Assembly. Mm -hmm. What was it about that bill that so undermined the Voting Rights Act? Well, the Voting Rights Act was premised upon the fact that we had to correct the history and the reality of political uh, racism mm -hmm. uh, in terms of who was voting and where they were voting and how many people were being represented. Um, what Chief Justice John Roberts said in that opinion was that there was no longer any kind of political discrimination against Black Americans. And therefore, that section, which was really the authorization for every change that took place, was no longer relevant or needed, and, and it was invalid. It was invalid, oh. which essentially threw the ball back into the legislators of all the states that wanted to sustain white racism, put it back in their hands, and they passed all these laws that were basically taking away the, the political rights of blacks. I mean, the number of the number of, of counties in these states where they shut down voting booths for black uh, voters, uh, where they essentially ignored the presence of black pop black the black population, and you know things like so many of uh, these counties required um, voter IDs. Now, for most people, the voter ID is your driver's license. There are so many hundreds of thousands of blacks who do not have driver's licenses. Yeah. And that means that you had, don't have a voter ID, you cannot get, a, get, get registered to vote. And it, the whole thing is just terrible in the terms of the consequences. And they're shutting down all the voting places in historically black counties. They're shutting them down. So even those who have a voter's license, a driver's license, um, have to travel miles and hours before they're able to vote anywhere. It's terrible. It's horrible. It sounds horrible. And I mean, as you think about the, the, the horrors of this, how did it, it sounds like you're saying in part that it, 
it freed up states to do what they wanted to do. Uh, it freed up states to uh, act in ways that they had been limited from doing because of preclearance with the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so now, if you look what just happened in Florida, mm -hmm. um, what happened in Florida was that under the, I would say, reactionary governor of Florida and the state legislature, what has happened in Florida is that they have eliminated four black congressional districts, four, four districts which elected black Congress people. They've eliminated those four black seats because of the way in which they've redistricted. So there will now no longer be any blacks in Congress from Florida, even though there were four uh, before this. And what all that does is simply to step backward into an era of racism which preceded the 1960s and the civil rights movements. That's frightening. I mean, there, it almost seems as though we learned nothing during the Obama administration about the fact that there is no, nothing to fear right. from black candidates. It almost seems as though, uh, was this a reaction in part, do you think, to uh, what happened under the Obama administration or that they elected a black man to be president? I don't think so. I think it was just the degree to which Roberts came into the court as a very strong conservative, mm -hmm. and he basically had uh, the five votes to uh, uh, declare um, that this section five of the law, which essentially was the it was was the section of the law which enabled blacks to vote, that was no longer ne necessary or relevant because political equality had been achieved, and that is just crazy. Roberts has now seems to have changed his position uh, on some issues at least, uh, but it was a terrible, terrible decision. I would have to agree with you 120% there too. Are, have there been consequences for things like uh, financing, voting? Uh, have there been consequences for fundraising and other things like this also as a result of uh, Shelby versus Holder? Well, in the sense that the, 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 the Black candidacies are no longer as viable as they were, means it's harder to go out and raise money for them. Uh, and it's just a question of having uh, eviscerated the foundations of Black political autonomy. Hmm. It's, it seems as though, uh, and this is a frightening thought, that the, the image that we had achieve something that we'd actually move forward was more illusory than uh, real. Uh, that as soon as people were able to, they undermined the appearance of justice, equality, and access to the polls. I think that's true. I think that there is uh, a very deep-seated desire to deny that, no, that racism exists any longer. There is a desire to uh, say, we've put all that behind us. Uh, we are now free of that burden. When in fact, we're not only not free of it, it's getting deeper and deeper, uh, particularly when you look at the economic situation uh, and the issues of home uh, and questions like that. Yeah. So to what extent is a problem, the problem that we're dealing with in terms of voting rights, uh, really a reflection of the larger fact that we have not dealt with the issue of race in America? I think it's exactly what's happening. And I think that uh, what you have in the Roberts decision in, uh, 1913, in 2013, uh, I'm still back in the last century. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what you have there is um, a confirmation of the desire of many established white Americans to say, we do not want to feel guilty anymore about race relations. And we can now say the Supreme Court has declared that that's a question that's behind us. Uh, and we don't need to have that section of the Voting Rights Act there anymore. We are now 
we can confirm the fact that we are free of that burden, when in fact what we've done is just to re increase the, the nature of the burden. Hmm. That's, uh, it's frightening to think about that. Uh, but there, there is hope, it sounds like. It seems as though there are efforts afoot within the US Congress, uh, like the John Lewis bill, for example, uh, to begin to restore uh, yeah. parts of, uh, was it section four, that right. might reinforce uh, the Voting Rights Act that might keep in place. Uh, so uh, let me ask you, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about such bills that are out there, and then also tell us why it is that with a, in theory, a, a president, a Senate, and a House that in theory should be favorably predisposed towards passing it, we have not seen this passed yet. Well, there's one big problem in there. The House has already passed it. Mm -hmm. So Nancy Pelosi has, has been a very effective leader in the House, and, and it's, it's out there, the John Lewis bill. The problem with the Senate is Joe Manchin from the state of West Virginia uh, and Cinema uh, from Alaska. And I think that uh, Manchin is not supportive of the Voting Rights Act at this point. Hmm. And I think unless you have 50 votes, you can't pass it with the vice president's vote breaking the tie. Instead, you have a 51-49 vote to defeat it. So you're basically dealing with uh, the strange politics of the Democratic Party in certain states. Uh, and Manchin is, uh, unfortunately, uh, a personality who is intent on charting his own path and not necessarily responding to the leadership of the party. Yeah, thank you for that clarification in that regard. Uh, because in the past, this is a bill that's had a considerable bipartisan support. Yes. Voting Rights Act, uh, every other time it's come up for review, has yes. had significant, uh, in, even when it was originally passed. Well, we're talking here now about a Republican party. I, I mean, I'm not sure what will happen with people like Mitt Romney and Susan Collins, who are very different kinds of Republicans than Mitch McConnell uh, and, and many other Republicans. But the Republican party, unfortunately, is not really leaning toward very much in the way of nonpartisan uh, coalitions. Uh, there is a real, a real cultural divide. Uh, and I don't want to get too much into politics, I'm, but the fact that the fact that 60% of all Republican voters say that Donald Trump won the election in 2020 is a scary, scary, scary reality. Because that means they are not confronting facts. They are not confronting the fact that Biden won by more than 6 million votes. Uh, and that is just incredible that there is that. Yeah. And that means that, there, that means that there's a whole cognitive barrier which keeps us from having the same set of facts in front of us that we can all deal with because they don't recognize that set of facts. Hmm. That's incredibly frightening. You're 100% right to think that we might be living in a place where there is no sense of truth there's no sense of a common reality in which we live, but we're living in right. worlds where two different quote unquote notions of truth prevail. Very troubling indeed. Uh, so uh, in this context, let's say they were able to pass um, the John Lewis Act. Let's say they were able to move there and reestablish preclearance. How would that help us at this point in time? Basically, it would give us the authority to go back to the Voting Rights Act uh, and in effect, refresh it and reapply it and create it as a viable mechanism for ensuring that black people could vote. But we're not gonna get there without a very, very significant set of changes. Well, when you say that, I, I was chuckling because I, I almost think that if we were to in the aftermath of what happened in Shelby versus Holder, go back and think about states needing preclearance. I don't think there'd be fewer states. I think there'd be more states. Yeah. 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 
-hmm. And when you look at what happened with what, what when you look at what's happened in Florida, mm -hmm. it is just uh, not only I mean what happened in Florida this year, but also what happened in Florida in 2000. I mean, I, I teach a course called What Might Have Been. Mm. And uh, what might have been if Al Gore had been chosen by the Electoral College mm -hmm. as president, even though he won the election, yes. what would have happened? It would have been a extraordinarily different situation in terms of our foreign policy. We would never have invaded Iraq. Uh, we might not have even had 9-11 because Gore was obsessed with Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what happened in that election was in effect that, and then this was a Supreme Court decision, uh, you ended up uh, creating a different kind of presidency, a different kind of politics. And that's continuing in Florida right now. Yeah, so I, I, in all of your statements, I hear uh, two things. Number one, history is not history. It continues to inform where we are today. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, what we're doing today is making the history of our children, our grandchildren, uh, of our nation going forward. Yes. And I think that we need to come to grips with that. We, you know, most of us kind of think that history is a given. Yeah. Uh, and that it's the way it has to be. But in fact, there have been countless times when if we'd taken the road not taken, I mean, most people don't realize that when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, mm -hmm. it came one month after he had signed an executive order to withdraw all American troops from Vietnam after the 1964 election. Wow. Instead, we shot Lyndon Johnson takes over and we go from 16,000 troops to 550,000 troops in Vietnam. What would have happened if that executive order of John F. Kennedy's had been enforced. Mm. Think about that. Mm, mm, mm. So we need to really recognize that history is history. We make we will make history, uh, and others will make history, and it's not a given. Uh, uh, this is a sort of a uh, uh, maybe an oddball left field kind of uh, question, but to what extent is history? significant for shaping today, i.e. the way that we tell history, the way that we shape narrative, uh, to what extent does that shape the way that we live our lives today? Well, I think that if you look at the history of what we did after 2000, whether it be 9-11 or the Afghanistan war or the Iraq invasion mm -hmm. and 20 years of war. That basically has shaped our current diplomatic position in the world. Mm -hmm. And if more of us were aware of the fact that it didn't have to go that way, mm -hmm. we might be able to think more about going the other way. Yeah. But the problem today, it seems to me, is that you know, I think we've never been as culturally divided since the Civil War mm -hmm. as we are today between the two parties. Now, that does not mean we're going to have another Civil War because we're not. But it does mean that our political system may well become totally dysfunctional. Yeah. And yeah. that's terrible for the kinds of issues we're talking about here today. Thank you for that. Uh, what do you think about uh, your good friend, uh, Nelson Johnson? Uh, his statement that we are currently in a cold civil war. I think that's largely true. Nelson is very, you know, I'm, I'm on, on a weekly phone call with Nelson and Joyce. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think what we need to do and what we're trying to do with that, that group is to create conversation within different cities where people of different backgrounds can talk to each other and engage each other and at least have a chance to work through some of these issues candidly as opposed to being completely separated. Amen. I, I hope that what we're doing in Charlotte is a representation of 
that larger work that uh, you and uh, Joyce and Nelson are doing, uh, trying to get yeah. that going. Uh, as we right. think about this, I think one of the questions that lingers for each of us is, wow, this seems like there's a lot that's going on on this level up here. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot that's going on with uh, the Supreme Court, with Congress, with the president. Uh, but what do we do? What can we do as individual citizens in this time to protect voting yeah. rights, to expand, not contract them? Uh, and to ensure that everybody's rights are respected? Well, I think we have to be willing to engage. Uh, and how does one engage? Well, one looks for different groups in our various locations who are actively pursuing these issues mm -hmm. and want to get us involved. Um, Getting, getting us involved in terms of talking to neighbors, talking to different people in different parts of the community. Um, we need to basically activate ourselves uh, and recognize that you know, movements for social change are not over. We can make them happen, but we have to do that by coming together and choosing to make, a pre make our presence known. Hmm. I love it. I mean, so, uh, so we don't have to feel as though we are completely lost. We don't have to feel as though we need to throw up our hands. There right. are things that we can begin to do. Absolutely. And I think that we just have to find a way to, to become part of our communities, become active part of our communities. Uh, each one of us lives in a different kind of a mm -hmm. place, would they're, they're all full of inequalities as well as conflicts. So we need to find a way of engaging those issues. Amen. We do need to find a way to engage and particularly in this fiercely partisan time, we yeah. need to find a ways not just to engage within our ideological, religious, theological groups, but even across that, to bridge that gap, to find ways of linking up people together. Uh, we've been doing something called Bridging the Gap here with Reimagining America Project that's been intentionally trying to say, how do we have necessary conversations with those uh, who th think of themselves as ideological enemies? Uh, yeah. Any advice for those of us trying to do that kind of work right now? Well, I think we need to identify, seek out, people on the other side who we can begin conversations with mm -hmm. and who we can use those conversations with as a foundation for larger conversations. Uh, you know, in a place like Greensboro, it's not hard to figure out who, uh, who's on which side. Yeah. Um, but what you can then do is to try to start conversations between different individuals on either side, on both sides, and see whether there's a, re, a, a realistic possibility of uh, coming together to identify common problems and then how to deal with those problems. But it's very, very hard, uh, especially when you're kind of trapped by what seems to be the status quo. Amen. The status quo is definitely something with which we have to wrestle if yes. we're going to get to someplace better. I think uh, one of the things that always stands out to me is that uh, we often take this understanding that we live in a great democracy, that we are so exceptional as a given, but I don't think it ever was. No. I think the notion of exceptional, uh, trying to be exceptional, living up to that was always a, a process, not a destination. It was right. always about constantly working towards becoming a quote unquote better union. Uh, how do we get that back again? Uh, that desire that each and every one of us has to continue to work towards this well, weakness that we expect. Let, 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 let's look at uh, the end of the New Deal and World War II as an example. Mm -hmm. um, you've got a fairly strong, you have a black cabinet in the New Deal. Uh, you have people like Mary McLeod Bethune, working closely with people like Eleanor Roosevelt, 
who is very supportive of civil rights. Mm -hmm. And they then become part of a very effective lobbying group. What that lobbying group does is to get Franklin Roosevelt to sign off on a Fair Employment Practices Commission, which ends discrimination in hiring in the war industries. Mm -hmm. What happens then is you have the war and you have you know, millions of white and black soldiers, um, but there are also millions of blacks who migrate to the North and the West and are taking jobs in decent factories and joining unions. Um, and then you have what is the basis for what then becomes the early civil rights movement. You, you, one of the things we don't generally recognize is that because of a woman named Ella Baker, who was in charge of recruiting members, mm -hmm. members during World War II, mm -hmm. she recruits most every town in the South. And the membership of the NAACP increases from 40,000 to 400,000 from 1941 to 1945. Okay. Mm -hmm. That becomes the basis for a brand new civil rights movement that comes into fruition uh, and really is uh, the first, you know, huge indication of that is the Montgomery bus boycott. And there too, that's led by women, black women, Rosa Parks, Joanne Robinson. Yes. They are the people who set that motion, that, that boycott in motion. That in turn then leads to the Greensboro sit-ins. And the Greensboro sit-ins lead to the formation of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was facilitated by Ella Baker. Uh, and the SNCC becomes the cutting edge of the civil rights movement and Freedom Summer in Mississippi. So all these things have happened and we have to recognize that they happened once, they can happen again. Amen. Uh, so uh, this, uh, um, this, as a follow-up to that, uh, if we look at what's going on right now in the struggle for voting rights in America, we hear names like Stacey Abrams, yes. Andrea Miller, uh, uh, Barbara Arnwine. Uh, these are black women that have stepped to the forefront and are working to reshape uh, the way that we have access to the polls and things like that. Why is it that African-American women have borne the burden and quite effectively so uh, for so long in seeking rights and justice in America? Well, partly I think it's because they talk to each other. Partly it's because they are very engaged in the leaders of the church, black church. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where many of them uh, plant their political roots and then build from that. Uh, and I think that uh, we, don't, we, we have not in our writings historically effectively rep represented or valued their contribution because we are, you know, we're sort of taken with the image of Martin Luther King Jr. or Stokely Carmichael. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are ignoring all those other people who were the grassroots foundation of what Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael were able to achieve. I mean, so uh, the, the general misogyny uh, in America has uh, kept us from seeing who actually was really yes. responsible for fostering change in this country. Absolutely. I mean, we, that's a huge issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's also a huge issue for white women mm -hmm. uh, and, and white men. But uh, uh, it's just, you know, uh, given the incredible uh, role of people like Ella Baker, uh, and Constance Baker Motley and others, you know, that's really, really important to recognize that. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to turn this conversation over to uh, uh, Mayor Roberts in a second, but I want to ask you this one last question, because it seems to have such relevance for today. We heard, uh, we, we heard a whisper from the Supreme Court about what it's about to do uh, in overturning Roe v. Wade. Right, right. Um, and uh, in essence, it sounds like it's coming down to a state's rights argument. Yes. We just talked a good deal about a Shelby versus Holder, which ends up looking much like a state's rights argument. 
uh, we think back towards uh, the causes of the Civil War uh, and how much this was intertwined with this notion of a state's right argument. Uh, why is it that it seems like whenever we begin to talk about quote unquote state's rights, we are often taking, talking about taking rights away from individuals guaranteed by the federal government? Well, I think that the whole notion of states' rights is essentially a product of white conservative establishment domination within those states. And the degree to which people in power are subservient to those people. Uh, it's just an incredible um, loss of, of, of autonomy, of autonomy. No, the, the very fact that, that uh, in so many Southern states at this point, I'm not sure where I read this, maybe Alabama, uh, some of the biggest counties of black people uh, have had almost all their voting places shut down. Uh, so that it's so, so much more difficult for them to be able to register. And I do think that the kind of thing we're seeing and have seen in Florida, uh, potentially at least might lead to a, re a revolt. I hope it does. Mm. That's being partisan, but it's also being very, very supportive of human rights. <laughs> Amen. Amen. May, may human rights prevail at the end of this uh, this this larger trajectory. What did Dr. King say? Uh, the moral luck of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Yes. I pray that it is. Praise. Uh, and I pray, pray that, that it is. Yes. In the right direction. So absolutely. Sometimes it seems as though it's gone back and forth. So yeah. But thank you so much for your time today and for uh, wrestling with these questions. And uh, Mayor Roberts, let me turn it over to you. Well, thanks, um, Rodney and Professor Chafe. Um, wow, um, you've given us a lot to think about. And Dr. Sadler, I, I have to laugh when you hand it over to me when Professor Chafe is talking about revolution. <laughs> I'm sure that was unintentional. Um, it, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but we've had some terrific questions in the chat that I want to get to. And then I have some questions. And um, I, I want to... I want to point out one thing, Professor Chafe, you started at the very beginning talking about the intersectionality yes. of these voting rights issues. And, and you talked about uh, the ability of people of color to earn a living, uh, you know, having gone from being property and being enslaved to then being on their own earning a living, but having tons of obstacles in their way, uh, including home ownership, political representation, um, health issues. I do a lot of talking about environmental health and how we have put people of color in unhealthy, polluted, toxic places for centuries. So I love the way you, you in, made that intersection so vivid. And what I wanna ask is a follow-up to that that comes from the chat, uh, which concerns money yes. and, and power uh, and this connection to voting rights. So there was another decision uh, called Citizens United that um, really opened the floodgates of money in political power and the connection of those. We know that people of color have historically had very little access to that, that um, monetary power and resources. So tell us the impact of Citizens United on voting rights and political representation. Well, I think that, that what it highlights is the ongoing and constant relationship between wealth and power. And we need to recognize that uh, it's very hard to talk about equality of citizenship without talking about greater access to monetary resources and the power that brings with it. Uh, so we really need to do a whole lot more in the way of connecting wealth and political power and political rights so that we can uh, talk about that openly instead of, oops. right now we have 
we act as though the statistics on black poverty are not related to political power. Mm. When in fact, they are pivotal to political power. And right. I think we need to just go forward and talk more about and, and with recognition of that interplay between economic and political rights. And so Citizens United, um, you would say, just exacerbated that difference. Yes, 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 yes exactly. Yeah, and uh, and really, you know, made it exponentially worse. Um, I, I, you know, I, we we kind of equate, you know, money with free speech, uh, which again is um, not not any kind of equity or equality in that, right? Um, because we know the deck is stacked. Uh, and we know that that some people are starting way before, you know, way behind the starting line when way it comes to, yeah, to trying to uh, to make a living and to be successful and to have that kind of of monetary power. Uh, we also talked in our uh, our series uh, with Reimagining America about educational disparities, and you know, again, uh, that is uh, connected to the money, the health, and the political representation. Um, so I want to follow up on another question that came in from the chat, and that is, um, we've had some discussion and controversy over, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones and the 1619 Project. Yes. And, uh, the question in the chat was, you know, I uh, wonder if the professor could talk a little bit about the impact of, of that work on voting rights and perceptions of voting rights. Well, you know, there are two sides to that issue. One is the content of the 1619 Project. The other is the role of the University of North Carolina's Board of Trustees in dealing with uh, uh, Dr. Jones and, and, and the fact that essentially one very wealthy donor was able to prevent uh, the administration of UNC from offering her tenure, which is, for most academics, the same thing as citizenship. You know, if you don't have tenure, you don't you, you don't have the right to speak out uh, and to follow your own your own your own beliefs. So basically, I think that uh, you know, she went to Howard. She'll be effective there. Uh, and but it's too bad that she didn't come to UNC because we sure do need her at UNC. I'm not sure that answers your question, but uh, it certainly speaks to me to, I mean, I, I have been in my role at Duke, very involved in collaborating projects with UNC, creating joint centers and um, working closely with faculty there in uh, Southern Studies and Oral History. Um, and we're, you know, we're, now, we're now almost completely divided. We don't, co we don't collaborate anymore. Oh. You know, we, we actually started together to have the Center for Documentary Studies as a Duke UNC combination center. Um, but we needed some hard money from both campuses to do that. And Duke gave us, gave us hard money and Carolina said no. Mm -hmm. So we now have the Duke Center for Documentary Studies, even though we keep on reaching out and having collaborations with people, our colleagues in UNC. And this, uh, the lack of collaboration began during the controversy over Nicole Hannah Jones and no, her team. No, no, it didn't be, it came well before that. The, 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 the controversy over her really is a product of what had already happened within the UNC system. It had wow. become a much more conservative place in the last 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, and there have been some editorials written um, in the Raleigh paper and WRAL and others um, worried about the academic freedoms and yeah. uh, the ability to express um, different viewpoints on a campus. You know, it's one of the things that North Carolina has been has been has you know been a point of pride for centuries. Yeah. Absolutely. Our state university system and its reach and its ability to educate our population and um, and really be accessible to 
people of all incomes and all races and ethnicities. Uh, so uh, it's very um, it's very disturbing for a lot of folks who do believe in academic freedom and free speech, and that that should be an inalienable right for all of us. Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm going to get back to. Um, a little bit more about voting rights. Um, I, I do some work with the Carter Center on uh, trying to depolarize our country, uh, but also restoring confidence in our election systems. And a recent seminar they had, uh, they brought in experts from Homeland Security who look at internet hacking and, and systems. And um, they brought in um, uh, Mr. Ginsburg and Mr. Bauer from the Presidential Election on Com uh, Commission on Election Reform. Um, and one of the things they talked about is that decentralization is actually helpful for security of the system uh, mm -hmm. because voting systems are not connected to the internet. Um, they're, very, they're very different in different states, the way that they operate. Uh, and that makes it harder to hack on a national level. It makes her harder to steal an election, which 30% of our population believes happened. Uh, they went through a number of explanations of, of the actual mechanics of how voting systems work that, uh, that, that showed that it was actually a positive that it was decentralized because there are very different geographic concerns and different resources and that sort of thing when you go county to county. Uh, but but there also was a need, as you've noted, for federal legislation uh, to make sure that those systems are fair, safe and secure and, and equal access. So talk a little bit about where the federal government does really need to intervene um, and some of the places where it's OK to be uh, decentralized, obviously. Internet, I mean, security is one because it, it makes it harder. But but where are the things, um, where are the places that the federal legislation needs to really um, support equal access? I think federal legislation has to create a framework of basic ground rules uh, that will govern all the states. Uh, we have a situation with 50 states uh, in which you know, the most populous states uh, don't have any control or power over uh, the least populous states. Mm -hmm. And the least populous states, frankly, at this point, are primarily the southern states and a few, a few in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we need to mm -hmm. get back to a situation in which we are willing to create basic ground rules that are going to govern all citizens all states, uh, and within those ground rules, the states can have the opportunity to make their own decisions. But right now, we're not doing that. We're not doing that, and it's uh, it's not helping us. You have a bunch of questions. I know I I, I can see that some questions are being directed toward me, and I'm not sure. I can't can't read them. Okay, no, that's not that's my job. <laughs> my job to read them. So um, you are a trusted voice in this painful story. Uh, this um, listener says to be brave and name three places that people of color can feel safe enough to lament the impact of this seems like an eternity of being pushed to the side over and over again. Three places. Well, one of them is Dr. Sadler's church and all the other churches that uh, people of color go to, uh, it's obviously the central institution in black and it's a place where people feel free uh, to be who they wanna be uh, and to exercise the, the, their voices. Um, I think that the uh, other places are, uh, can be universities, um, you know, we, we have some terrific predominantly black universities in North Carolina uh, where there's a terrific uh, basis for reaching out and trying to create greater strength for the community, but also in relationship to other institutions which are predominantly white. 
So, you know, I, I'll just tell you a couple of things. Duke is, believe it or not, this is really interesting. Duke is now 52% non-white. 52% non-white. When I was dean, it was 13% non-white. When I left being dean, it was 35% non-white. Now it's 52%. So, you know, we've, we, we've got a lot of opportunity going on there uh, to then develop relationships across campuses uh, if we can. So I'm sorry, that, 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 that's probably all I, should, all I should say on that. No, that's terrific. And I, I agree, houses of, of faith and uh, universities um, should be safe places, yeah. um, should be. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing politics and polarization enter into those as well. Yes. Um, and I, um, I feel the pain of those who worry there are no safe places anymore. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, women are getting into that category now too. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and people of color and there are other marginalized folks who have, have had to deal with this. Um, I, I want to, um, uh, there, are, there are a couple other questions I wanted to raise. Um, and, and again, this is legislation. Um, the concern, that uh, more progressive states have, um, how can they protect rights if federal legislation tries to restrict them? Well, that's a very good question and it's very difficult because you've got all kinds of constraints uh, which can inhibit you from acting on those freedoms. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know how to answer that question. Um, here, I just, it's, it's a, it's a, we are, we are really in, in a very difficult place right now in terms of the degree to which we are culturally divided and not listening to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder how we're going to be able to work our way out of that. And one of the ways you could do that is if you had more authority in the federal government to create ground rules, which everyone has to obey. Mm -hmm. But we're not doing that now. We're not doing that now. And uh, the degree to which a place like Florida, which should be one of the most progressive states in the country given its wealth and given its popularity, et cetera, it, it is now one of the most reactionary states in the country. Well, if I could ask a question, I am, I think I'm torn. It seems as though uh, some of these decisions are, I uh, use the term that was used by the uh, appellate court, uh, working with surgical precision against black and brown voters. Yes. Some of these decisions, uh, this seem to be so obviously racially biased. How is it that yes. uh, population, our American population as a whole, uh, is not offended by this, is not disturbed by this, and doesn't see this as a, uh, a forsaking of our American mm -hmm. desire for equality and justice. Uh, is it just because Black people aren't seen as fully human? Uh, what, what's the, how does this happen? I think that the, it happens because the average citizen may not be aware of what you just said and the degree to which power is being distributed to conservative people around the country. Um, I do believe that once, you know, just, just, just take for example, the publicity in the last three days that has surrounded the Roe v. Wade draft. I have almost never seen as many articles in as many newspapers or magazines immediately on the anxiety, terror, and anger mm -hmm. over what the that the, the, what the Alito position uh, the decision is the draft is saying. I do believe that the degree to which we are able to get more conversations going around those kinds of issues. Uh, and the fact that they can generate that kind of conversation is shown by what's happened with Roe v. Wade. 
but I do think we need to have more attention in our media outlets about these kinds of issues so that they can be debated in a much more forthright and candid way. I would add to that, we need to have more responsibility in our media outlets. Mm -hmm. uh, they are too eager and willing to disseminate half truths, yeah. uh, partial truths and complete lies. Yes. Uh, without doing background research or anything to verify. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and they sensationalize the, the lead and the headline. So um, I'm, I, I'm calling on the media to be more responsible. We, we all need that. Yes. Uh, absolutely. If, if I could ask another question, it has to do with our notion of civics. Uh, I, I mean, I've heard since I was a kid that we were uh, losing our understanding of civics as general citizens of this nation, that we weren't teaching it as much to our kids. Uh, is this the, uh, is what we're seeing today uh, the seeming lack of agency of the vast majority of people in this nation? Uh, we, what do we do? It just sort of happens. Is this a result of our lack of formation of citizenship and an understanding of what it takes to effectively govern a democracy? Well, I think, yes, it is. But then the question is, how do we stimulate citizenship involvement, citizen involvement? How do we create organizations that are going to insist on discussion and debate around these issues? That's one of the things we're doing with our Truth, Justice, and Reconciliation Commission, trying mm -hmm. to find a way to create a dialogue between people in different communities uh, I, I, that will recognize how important to be invested. Sorry. No, I was just gonna gonna add when you when you first talked about that, um, you mentioned about being sure that we don't make people feel guilty for things that happened in the past. Yeah, that we want people now to feel like they have agency and can take action and that it impacts them now yes. that, that we're not, um, you know, holding them responsible for something their great, great grandfather did. However, <laughs> we are holding them responsible to uncover the truth and, and to know why they are where they are and why the, the success and access is so disparate between white people and people of color. Yeah. I think there has to be a, willingness to not be defensive mm -hmm. and to be able to have an honest conversation with different points of view and different perspectives, part of that conversation. Uh, and to recognize <coughs> that acknowledging difference does not mean ending difference, it is the first step toward coming together and being able to talk to each other. And, and rehumanizing. <coughs> yes. People. Yeah. Humanizing. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, um, and, you know, th there are some people who are motivated by guilt, so it's not entirely a bad thing, <laughs> but, uh, but the, the one-to-one -one the personal connections and conversation, the willingness to be vulnerable and to learn and to grow and change yeah. um, is really key. I, I want to, I, I want to acknowledge we have about five minutes left in this uh, discussion, but there is a question that we all need to hear your answer to. Uh, and it's a good one to end uh, this conversation on. And that is what gives you hope? Well, one of the things that gives me hope is my students. Mm. Uh, I teach two seminars, uh, one on the civil rights movement, one on the question what might have been, which I referred to earlier. 
And the students uh, after the first class are told that two of them each week are, are gonna run the class and I'm not gonna talk until the second hour. Um, and they flourish. They just come to the fore and ask the most fantastic questions. And they all, every, every, every week, every single student takes part. So one of the answers to that question is, how do you get people to own their own responsibility mm -hmm. to participate in these kinds of discussions and to listen to other, what other people have to say and then come to some opportunity of dialogue and maybe eventually agreement. That's very uh, important. To, that's a very great source of optimism for me. Uh, and it's just an incredible experience to watch the uh, students uh, every week, <laughs> which I've been doing for 50 years. <laughs> wow, you must have started when you were five. <laughs> no, 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 I'm now, I'm now a... <laughs> I'm very happy to uh, still be teaching. Praise God. It's fabulous. Yeah. That, and I know, I just want to say, I know that uh, the man that asked that question was overjoyed when you said your students were what gives you hope uh, as a person involved in education himself. Uh, let me just say uh, thank you so much, Dr. Che, for your time tonight. Thank you so much for the brilliance of your, your answers and your willingness to dive deep with us. Uh, into these questions that plague us today because of what's going on as we deal with our highest courts, what we as we deal with uh, what's going on in our federal government yes. uh, as a result, as, as it revolves around issues of voting, access to polls, uh, participation in democracy. It's been significant to hear you give us your insight and to give us uh, literally a history that started uh, you gave us something from 1600s all the way to today. So uh, <laughs> baptism in, uh, in history. Uh, let me say that this has been a rich conversation. I want to thank you, Mayor Roberts, for uh, helping us frame this conversation as well as uh, bringing it home with questions from the audience as well, uh, as you do so perfectly at all points in time. And I also want to say that I'm, in, I'm emboldened, inspired, encouraged by this conversation because I keep hearing constant notions that there's hope. And I also realized something else. People would not be fighting so hard against the expression of our rights if we weren't a legitimate threat to begin to have more of these rights, enact more agency, and begin to participate in a much greater fashion in our community. Change will come. Change is coming but it will take each and every one of us to work together, to find new partnerships, to develop the kind of relationships that sustain true and legitimate change. I'm glad to be with two great heroes for change tonight. I wanna to say thank you to uh, Samantha Turner and Deandra Brooks for their leadership and uh, putting this conversation together. Thank you for the voting rights uh, subcommittee and for the way that you all have continued to work in this regard. Thank you to each and every person that's joined us both on the Zoom and on our various ways of broadcasting. This has been a wonderful engagement. I want you to please join us for our next panel discussion on Wednesday, May 25th at 5.30, uh, where we continue this conversation on the racialization of representation and with what we hope will be a wonderful and effective panel of speakers that will uh, bring this home even further. Uh, this work continues. And again, you are always invited to participate in this great work. Let's end with a word of prayer, however. One who is greater than us, one who calls us to a higher standard, who offers us a better way of being. Use us, Lord. Use us for your purposes. Use us to foster a world that truly reflects a notion that we all are equal, we all deserve justice, and we deserve that with great equity. 
Thank you for all that you have done in us, for us, and help us to bear faithful witness to a better world. We call on you by many names, and all of them we remain grateful to you. Amen. 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 Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. God bless you all. <laughs>